Joining me now is Sky News contributor Louise Roberts and, and commentator Samara Gill. Samara, the King is meant to be on holidays, but he's made this special visit to Southport, uh, Southport in the aftermath of that terrible multiple stabbing last month. Can you tell us about the visit? Hi, Caroline. Great to be back with you. Look, I mean, the royal family shines the brightest when there's the most division in the country, and they're pretty much the only people that can unify us at a time like this. I think there's so much going on in the UK, so much polarization of each other, and I think it was a beautiful gesture by the King to leave Bal or not go to Balmoral, which is historically, obviously, was the Queen's favourite place. It's one of his favourite places. And, you know, obviously he's still going through chemotherapy treatment, but no, he showed up stoic as he always is and did what he needed to do for this country. And it was beautiful to see him speak to all the leaders of the community. He spoke to the head of the mosque. Um, he visited the families and had a tea party with the children. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those children actually witnessed the horror. And so I think a tea party with the king, something light, something a bit jovial is exactly what they needed. And, you know, it's a real, it's a real sort of tribute to Charles as a person and it really showed his humanity. It's just upsetting that Harry had to ruin it by saying what happens online transfers onto the streets and sort of taking a jibe at Elon Musk and making it about himself. I think the King triumphed in this situation and showed who the bigger person was. <clears throat> I, I absolutely agree with that. And Louise, we have spoken before about how monarchy provides the stability in times of crisis, whether it be political or cultural or economic. And I think this is an excellent example of that engagement with everyday Britons, like Samara said. That's right. As, as, we're both, as you both said at the top of the show, that he's, the easy way which he spoke to people who come to see him and the reassurance that the monarch provides and has done historically for such a long time. You think of way back to World War II when, of course, Queen Elizabeth, who then became the Queen Mother, refused to leave London even though the Blitz was happening, and she stayed there. And people in London, and Samara may know this as well, they still talk about the fact that the royal family stayed in the capital rather than flee to the countryside to safety as well. And, of course, during coronavirus, where we were all sort of crippled by COVID-19, Queen Elizabeth then, um, of course, made that sort of unprecedented televised address, urging us to sort of remember our wartime spirit and to all stick together to try and fight this insidious um, pandemic at the time. So I think that... Um, People do look to the monarchy to, to to provide that stability and reassurance. And the difference, of course, is that Charles is apolitical. So it's although the Prime Minister, of course, will go to certain situations, there's always a fear there's an agenda, it's a popularity play for votes further down the line. But Charles is not like that. He really is just there for the people. Mm. Very, very well said. And Samara, while he was in Southport, Charles also provided us with an update on his health. What did he have to say? Yeah, it was really nice, actually. Um, one of the reporters um, asked him about his health and he said, you know, I'm doing well. And uh, it's just really a testament to his courage that he's doing chemotherapy. He's fully has cancer. And the fact that he still gets out there and visits the people of the United Kingdom says really a lot about him. Um, and our king and who we have to serve our country. So I think that it's really nice to see that same stoicism that obviously the Queen always had. Um, but the fact that he's going out there, he's shaking hands, as all reports said, he stayed much longer than he was meant to in Southport, making sure that he saw everyone, making sure that he said hello, was having those conversations and was trying to provide some unity to the community that is so divided right now. And Louise, uh, you know, we spoke last week on the show about uh, the Sussexes and their not royal royal tour to Colombia. Well, a great question has been asked this week, and that is, what did the Colombia trip achieve? Now it's over. I mean, last last week on the show, there was still a day or so to go. Is there any more clarity at this point? Well, what's been interesting is that Meghan and Harry, of course, said they were going to Colombia to highlight the dangers of child safety on the internet. And since then, the Vice President of Colombia, Marquez, who invited them to Colombia, has said, oh, the purpose of this trip was to boost international tourism and invite extra trade into the country. So already there's a disconnect there, and that sort of plays into some fears that perhaps bright and shiny Meghan and Harry were being used in some way. I don't know, but 
And what's interesting is, as well is that their mission was woolly from the start. They're, a campaign like this, a royal tour has to have an objective, whether it's the government committing more money or a global alliance or something. But Harry and Meghan don't have that pull. They're non-working. They're, they're, not, they're not the working royals anymore, so they don't have the gravitas of, say, William and Kate, where they can make these things happen. So, really, it becomes a platform for their publicity just to keep them relevant on a global stage. And Samara, it's been reported that the Colombian security chief has hit out at the cost of the Sussex tour and there's obviously a socio-economic crisis and cost of living crisis there like in other parts of the world. Now the security fees were eye-watering. Um, it's not entirely clear who has paid for what but it does look a little bit tone deaf. Yeah, Louise is completely right when she talks about Marquez inviting them. Obviously, Meghan and Harry made it political in that way because it's a government-aligned thing now. And so, yeah, it's now becoming an issue that $2.9 million was spent on a three-day tour for the royals. Of course, it's unclear who paid for that. We know that they paid for their own travel there, but that's sort of part and parcel of them actually coming. I think that the whole tour really was very tone deaf. Meghan, as per usual, wasn't really thinking about the optics in the way that maybe British or Australian people would. She was obviously, she was wearing a $90,000 wardrobe, and I think that's in pounds, so double it if you're over in Australia, for a three-day tour. Now, the average income in Colombia is just around $10,000 per year, so she's wearing about 10 years worth of the average income you know, for a three-day tour of Colombia, which is a country which is riddled with problems. It really is. And the fact that that $2.9 million could have been spent on something a lot more critical to helping them, helping maybe mothers in the region, helping fight the drug gangs that they face, it's really disappointing, to be honest. And I just feel like Harry and Meghan need to think about these things a little more before they think about themselves and put themselves on this worldwide privacy, you know, invasion of their privacy to just go on tour and promote, I don't know, their jam pots that they're trying to sell. It, it just, the whole thing is very muddled to me and it just doesn't really make sense optically. Now, Louise, on to a bit more graceful advocacy and we understand Queen Camilla is working on a new documentary. What do we know so far? Well, one of um, Camilla's key causes, a cause very close to her heart, is domestic violence and raising the profile of that. And what she would say is breaking down the barriers of silence, which she says a lot of survivors have said to her is absolutely critical to assaging this sort of peril in society. So what's happened is that ITV have been filming her for the, about the past year for a documentary coming out later this year called Her Majesty the Queen Behind Closed Doors. And in that documentary, Camilla talks to a lot of survivors of DV but also she does a lot of private work away from the cameras, Megan, take note, where she counsels these victims and sort of hears their story firsthand, which is just fantastic. So to see this documentary play out, play out on ITV, I think will be wonderful because it will really raise the profile of this as a global issue, not only in the UK as well. And she's also a patron of many um, groups who do advocate for victims of domestic violence. So all in all, it's a great, a great exercise, a great documentary. And Samara, briefly back to the Sussexes, and we continue to hear stories about people distancing uh, themselves from the Sussexes, where previously uh, they may have uh, been in better company. What's been reported this time? Well, I was going to say to you, obviously, happy birthday for yesterday, Caroline. Um, <laughs> it made me think of uh, Thomas Markle and the fact that he spent his 80th alone without his grandchildren um, begging through the media, which is the only way he can contact his daughter, which he gave his whole life for, um, and saying, please, please, can I see my grandchildren? I'm turning 80. I'm not getting any younger. So, you know, the Sussexes, they're always distancing themselves from people. I mean, we forget that these are people that, to their wedding, instead of inviting their blood relatives or their family, they invited the Cloonies and Oprah. And there's a very famous line of, you know, George Clooney, uh, sorry, Oprah asking the Cloonies, you know, how do you know Megan? And sort of Amal saying, well, we don't. We've never met her, but, you know, she invited us here. Whereas she swiped her sister, her brother, 
um, and all those other people that were included in her upbringing. So, you know, these people, I'm not surprised by obviously reports that Harry's friend, um, he'll get the occasional WhatsApp. That's more than a, he gives a lot of people. They are just interested in fulfilling their reputation, their selves at this point. Anyone who can't help them along the way is going to get biffed. And time and time again, we see this. And I just feel bad for a lot of the people that were originally in Harry's life, you know, that have been completely let go of because they don't serve a purpose or they don't have the right look for him now and what he's trying to convey with his new Montecito sort of latte sipping life. I love that. I absolutely love that. And Louise, I've only got about 30 seconds. But lastly, a commentator has said that William wouldn't likely invite Harry to his coronation. That does seem severe, not entirely unexpected. Are we at that point where there is no goodwill left? There's very little goodwill we know between William and Harry, but to not have his brother at his coronation would be catastrophic, I think. I mean, this is the one thing the two of them have been working towards their entire lives when William becomes king. Now, Harry may whinge in his autobiography, spare that he doesn't want any part of that, but really that's his life's purpose, to support his brother when his brother is king. So I, I think it would just be... Um, unthinkable. Maybe Kate may come to the rescue. There's also a report saying that um, she sort of mourns the friendship with Harry and is very grateful still for his support when she joined the royal family, which is, you know, a very um, difficult path to follow, as we know. So maybe Kate will be the pe peacemaker and this will never happen. Let's hope so.